Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. Start your day tomorrow with the Daily Dog with Michelle Forto, the morning podcast on Dog Works Radio. Apple podcast reviewer Patty Christensen calls it funny, smart, and filled with all the info I want to know about dogs. I love this show. Wake up with the Daily Dog, available on Dog Works Radio on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your shows. Dog Works Radio Network presents Mushing Radio, hosted by Robert Forto. Mushing Radio is about dog-powered sports, living in the Great White North, and mushing. Visit our website at mushingradio.com. Here is your host, Robert Forto. Hello and welcome, everybody. This is Robert Forto, and you're listening to Mushing Radio here on KVRF 89.7 in the Matsu Valley, Radio Free Palmer org is our live streaming site. You can find all of our episodes over on dogworksradio.com. And joining us from California is our co-host, Alex Stein. Alex, how's it going? It's going, it's going really well, Robert. It is uh, the dog days of summer right here. Uh, we're taping this right around the end of July, and it is, um, it's pretty much really, really hot everywhere in the country and in a lot of places in Europe as well. And I know there's been some, some really kind of unusual and unseasonably hot weather up in Alaska as well. It has been. It's been a really warm summer. And for folks that are listening, I apologize for the dogs barking in the background, but this is a dog show, so hopefully you don't mind. But, yes, we've had record-breaking summer temperatures here. It just finally started raining uh, just this past week or so, and I think we are making a turn for the better. And before you know it, we'll be doing uh, fall training up here in the Matsu Valley and hopefully a great winter to come. Uh, absolutely. And we have, you know, we've been looking at the, we had a very healthy um, turnout for uh, the Iditarod picnic and had 40, 40 teams sign up, I believe, on the day of the picnic. And we've had a couple have um, have uh, trickled in since then. We're currently up to 42 teams that have signed up. Uh, the the latest two are uh, Casey Murringer and Alan Eichens. Um So sort of uh, from Willow and Wasilla. So you know, um, pretty pretty much local to where you are or nearby where you are. It's looking really impressive for 42 people to be signed up here in the middle of summer. That's a, that says some things compared to the last couple of years where we really had had a, a very small field even up until the end of the signups, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, we did. And you know, it's it's interesting because there we're we're in sort of a um I guess you you call it sort of a lull because there are a lot of people who want to sign up um on the day of the picnic, and um, there are certain advantages to that, as as we've discussed in the past, and um, and then people their plans start really kind of solidifying as they get into fall and doing fall training, and and there's always a bunch of people who sign up, you know, in um, in October and November, and up until the deadline, which is either the end of November or the beginning of December, and. Um, but we're at that point where maybe if we're lucky, there will be one or two people every week or every couple of weeks in the summer. But it, it's it's not really the, the time where we expect a lot of people to sign up. That's right. And starting in about mid-September through the first week or so of October is the time when a lot of the mid-distance races are accepting their entries. And we've talked about that many times here on the show about how quickly a lot of those races fill up. I know I've already started getting notices from uh, the Connect 200 and the Willow 300 race here here locally, and they're already talking about what's going to happen next year. So typically, uh, folks will sign up for those relatively quick, and then they'll make those plans, as you mentioned, to figure out whether they're going to sign up for Iditarod or not uh, a few minutes later. Right. And, you know, one of the things that we had that we had talked about is that um, 
one of the advantages to signing up at the picnic is that they draw two names for um, people who will get uh, um, basically free entry, people who get their entry fee back um, on the day of the picnic because their, their names are drawn. And one of the things that, that happened that um, I don't think we've, we've uh, talked about because it, it was relatively recent is that um, Mitch CV had um, Mitch CV had been one of the people who won the free entry at the picnic. And Mitch CV, as as most of our, our listeners know, or most people who've been following Iditarod, is uh, n- not only a, a I believe a three time Iditarod champion, but is is really one of the premier mushers, and more importantly, is uh, one of the mushers in the sport who who has a a very large kennel operation. Um, uh, and then after the after the picnic there was an evacuation for um, some mushers uh, because of a fire. And one of the mushers who, uh, who evacuated was Rick Casillo, who, um, who runs a uh, kennel and an organization called Battle Dogs and specializes in, um, you know, his, his cause that is near, to de- near and dear to his heart and the, and the cause that he always dedicates his Iditarod runs to is veterans who have combat veterans with PTSD. And he also, you know, has a, um, does charitable work for these veterans. And I believe um, has, has some who, who work for him up at his kennel or, or has like a separate program up at his kennel, but he evacuated. And then there was, there was considerable fire damage to his, um, to his home and his kennel area. And they had, they had a, a transformer that, that, um, uh, um, that that caught fire and there there was a lot of a lot of damage and it was it was not looking very good for him and uh, Mitch Seavey decided that uh, since he had gotten his um, his entry fee back he, he had gotten this four thousand dollars back that he had planned on spending anyway he uh, sent that money to Rick so essentially depending on how you want to look at it, either gave Rick a free entry to Iditarod in 2020 or gave him the equivalent of a free entry that he could use in rebuilding his kennel. And although I, I want to stress that although Mitch CV is someone who has a, a large kennel and is, is, you know, relatively well off in the field of dog mushing, this is not someone who by any conventional way of looking at things is someone you would consider rich. So for someone to turn around and uh, donate this $4,000 to someone he knows, a friend of his, uh, a member of this community who's in need is really just, it, it's kind of a wonderful thing. And it, it goes back to what, what we like to talk about a lot, which is that not only is this a sport, not only are there, are there fierce competitors and, and interesting stories, but it's also very much a community. You know, I, I remember reading that on Facebook, and, and yes, those fires were approaching pretty close to both Rick and uh, Karen Hendrickson's home up north of Willow, closer to to Talkeetna. And I remember seeing just just the amount of of, uh, of support that was coming in after Mitch did that for Rick and, and what, what a way to give back. And I know you had mentioned that it was sort of a community uh, effort in a lot of ways, the way that uh, the Iditarod folks or mushing folks in general take care of each other. And what re- really reminded me about this was Scott Jansen has done many things like this in the past as well, hasn't he? Yeah, he, he really has. And, and in fact, I remember when there were, when there were the really, really big fires that were causing lots of people in and around Willow to have to evacuate, he basically put a a message out on Facebook and said, listen, I have a gigantic dog trailer. I'm going to be going up and down the parks highway. Anyone who needs any help, just let me know and I'll do whatever, whatever you need. Right. He has a, a large, for folks that may not know, Scott Jansen owns Jansen Funeral Homes, and uh, he's, he's a very well-respected musher in the mushing community, and he has 
a very large parking lot that's part of his funeral home just south of Wasilla. And I remember that they had just bought that building not too soon before the big fires up here, the Sockeye fires that we're talking about. And I remember he opened up that property for anybody that that wanted to stay there that may be evacuated and, you know, offer their services there. And it was just a, a great community service project and, and not to diminish anything that uh, that Mitch did for Rick. But when you're talking about these two gentlemen, both he, he and Scott uh, giving out uh, their hard-earned time and hard-earned money. I think that really just speaks uh, kudos to the mushing community and what a great way to give back. Because as you mentioned, uh, a $4,000 entry is not anything to sneeze about on any stretch of the imagination, and that was one heck of a gen generous effort. I know there has been other news about fires recently, as well as one that is also close to home, to Iditarod. Can you share the story about uh, the one up near Rainy Pass? Yeah, so um, there was a, uh, uh, I believe it was started by a lightning strike, uh, and that I think is something that is becoming more and more frequent in Alaska. It used to be that there, there weren't as many wildfires because there weren't as many lightning strikes um, in past years. That seems to be changing a lot um, so there was a lightning strike, and there was a small fire that started near Rainy Pass, and then that grew to uh, about 120 acres, and they evacuated the area. Rainy Pass is um, not only an Iditarod checkpoint, but it's home to a, uh, a roadhouse and that is used during the summers as a hunting lodge, and it's just a, a, a very, very scenic and wonderful place. They had to evacuate um, the lodge. They brought in um, firefighters and uh, uh, um, uh, helicopter, I believe, to do to do some water drops there, um, and commun co converted the uh, roadhouse there to an emergency shelter for the firefighters. Some of the um, workers at the roadhouse elected to stay on so that they could. Uh, so that they could cook for the firefighters and provide whatever the firefighters needed while they were there. And I believe the, um, the guests who were staying there were evacuated to uh, an emergency shelter that was set up um, nearby. Rainy Pass is about 150 miles from Anchorage, but it is off the road system. So it's, uh, it's not a place that you can, you can just drive to. You have to I believe during the summer, fly in and out. Um, uh, there might be there might be a way to get there by river, um, and of course in the in the winter you can get there by dog sled. But it the last I heard is that they were getting some containment on that fire, but I believe that it is still burning. Yeah, it, this was just a couple of days ago where this uh, this news hit, and as you mentioned. Uh, the Rainy Pass area and the the Rainy Pass checkpoint are not accessible by 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 road system as well as as most of the checkpoints on the Iditarod Trail. So I would imagine it's it's a difficult effort on uh, on the firefighters as well as anybody that is up there. I don't think there's a lot of folks that live up there year round, and I know that the the Rainy Pass checkpoint and lodge was one of the folks one of the places where folks had to evacuate and that's the reason we're telling this story here today because as we mentioned before uh when when uh when people need to come together they come together in in all forms and i think that's what's happening here uh because they are truly part of the iditarod community even though uh you know they're not mushers they're the ones that that hold down the checkpoint aren't they Right, and you know the um, there are a number of checkpoints that are 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 basically the um, uh, held in these these roadhouses, these lodges, and um, the these people when when the when the Iditarod comes through, they just they just make everyone welcome. They do all sorts of things. There are traditions at a lot of these um, checkpoints. Uh, that that people will come back and the same volunteers will be there year after year and they'll have 
you know, one person will, will cook something special that is available for the mushers or, you know, some people will have different things that they bring in from out of state or whatever. So it's, uh, these roadhouses are very, very important to Iditarod and Iditarod fans may, may not actually think of them as existing outside of the race, but in most cases they are, they are, you know, places that are big tourist destinations that have, a lot of people come in to hunt and fish and to, you know, uh, to, to camp and be part of the wilderness um, uh, during the summer as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, our next story, Alex, is, is more of an update that we talked about during I Did a Rod, and, and it's my understanding that they were not attached to the race in any way. I don't even know if they were following the race as they were, but there, there's an update to that plane crash that went down just the first couple of days of the race. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Um, and that was, uh, uh, sorry, I don't have the information in front of me, but do you, do you have the, the details for that? I, I can pull it up. I can pull it up and we can talk about that in just a second. But what we do want to mention today, sort of our, 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 our story of the day is we've been talking all afternoon or all show as, as we will about sort of the changing weather and the way that weather is affecting uh, the Iditarod and mushing in general. And I know in the last few months that's hit home to a lot of kennels, not only here in Alaska, but countrywide. There are even uh, uh, bills being introduced about um, temperature uh, regulations in regards to sled dogs, if you can keep your dog outside if it's too warm or too cold, and, and of course all of the other types of legislation that are coming into play. And I know we've talked a little bit about this in the past, about how climate change will probably be one of the big effectors of mushing. I think climate change, economy, and and just you know the the animal rights folks and that sort of thing are the real big players in what's going to happen down the road. What are your thoughts with this uh, going forward? Yeah, you know, there's uh, there are laws in a couple of states. I know there's a law in Pennsylvania, and I believe there's a a new law or a proposed new law in New York State that we were that we couldn't we couldn't figure out exactly what the status of this was before we went on air. Um, basically, uh, saying things like, if you have a dog, a dog cannot be outside for more than 30 minutes if it's below 32 degrees. And while I understand the, the desire to keep dogs safe and to keep dogs warm, um, that doesn't make a lot of sense for sled dogs. And, you know, as, as long-term listeners know, 32 degrees Fahrenheit is pretty warm for a sled dog. Uh, sled dogs, um, you know, uh, Alaskan Huskies and, and those type of northern breed dogs are very, very comfortable when it's, when it's below zero. So um, this seems like it's a, it seems to me like it's a misguided attempt to protect all dogs that doesn't really take into account some of these northern breeds. And if this were if this were to really be enforced, it would essentially uh, outlaw mushing in many of these states um, because you would you would not be able to have dogs on harness running for more than a half hour. And that that seems that seems absurd. I I you know like like you and like most of our listeners I absolutely love dogs and want to do whatever I can to protect them, but it seems like this is a little bit misguided to me. Oh, I agree, and and thankfully it has not been introduced up here in Alaska, and I think that uh, that you know there there are many reasons why it never would. But when you're dealing with this in musher populated states, you had mentioned uh, Pennsylvania and also in New York and Wisconsin and Minnesota and just about anywhere north that uh, that gets uh, snow in the winter this can this can really play havoc on on a sled dog kennel and i think they are, there's good intentions here in particular with pet dogs and you know folks that leave uh the golden retriever outside when it's you know 
negative temperatures, minus 5, minus 10, below zero, uh, and leaving the family pet outside. But when you're dealing with working dogs and dogs that are, are bred for this, I think that's where uh, the, the argument really lies. But I guess my question to you, Alex, uh, I'm looking at it obviously from a musher's perspective, you're looking at it from a fan's perspective, but how can you have a law on the books for one class of folks and then not enforce that with the other? And I have an answer at least up here in Alaska, but what are your thoughts on that? How could they say, well, you're under this law, but you're not, whether it's uh, you know being too cold or being on harness or, or whatever? What are your thoughts on that? You know, I think there's a number of ways to approach it. Certainly, this this is a law that would make a lot more sense in a city than it would out in more rural areas. Um, and I think that there there also are ways to address it in terms of what's what's an acceptable structure to to have for for northern breed dogs in in rural northern climates. You know, and and you can certainly have I've seen. I've seen dog houses that that really look very very warm especially when you have straw when you can put straw inside them and and there are a lot of dog houses that look like they would do a great job of protecting a dog from from the wind and from the from the low temperatures um so I think that might be one way of looking at it and and I think that what another thing that really needs to happen is uh We've we've seen, especially in the last few years, animal rights activists are um, usually very well organized, and they're able to to get a lot of attention and to get a lot of um, a lot of things through in terms of legislation. Uh, I I think that it's time for mushers to start being more organized and for mushers to start speaking out more. Uh, you know about laws and about what what good and best practices are and what acceptable care is and and you know doing a job of educating some of these people making laws so that they know that you know your your little uh, you know your little Airedale that you have in a, in an apartment building is not the same as an Alaskan husky. So I think exactly I think that would that would really help. I, I agree, and as I mentioned uh, before you had answered that question, we do have those types of, of um, procedures in place up here in Alaska. In Anchorage and in the Matsu in particular, on the Animal uh, Control Board, the folks that make these type of rules in, uh, in two of the largest uh, municipalities slash boroughs in, in, the, in the state in terms of population, they have a musher representative on that board and they have that voice to be able to, to, to voice their concerns and to help uh, the folks that are making those rules make the right rules in regards to mushing. And also up here in the Matsu Valley, and I believe it's in other boroughs as well, is that uh, sled dog kennels are looked at under a different light in terms of registration of the animals and kennel inspections and, and all of that. And we have a, a pretty rigorous process that we have to go through in order to be licensed by the borough with kennel inspections and you know documentation and evacuation plans and all the like and i think if other uh, municipalities around the country would look at our our uh, system as a model i think it could really help on on issues like this in particular with uh the one that we we're talking about in Pennsylvania, and I also believe in New York, uh, I think that uh, this could easily be adopted at places like that as well. Alex, I know you have to run early today, and I want to do a quick update on the plane crash that we talked about. But before we talk about that, I have to apologize to our listeners that are probably screaming at their headphones or at their computer screens right now because we really butchered up this episode, Something Fierce. The fire uh, that we talked about happened near Finger Lake, which is another checkpoint on the Iditarod Trail, and the plane crash happened up near Rainy Pass. Now, these checkpoints are both very close together. In fact, uh, they are next to each other on the trail if you're working your way 
up the Iditarod Trail from Yetna to Squitna to uh, Finger Lake to Rainy Pass and then on down through the gorge and whatnot. But yes, the, uh, the plane crash happened near Finger Lake. And we brought this up during Iditarod because on March 7th, a plane went missing. It was a plane that was due back at the Wasilla Airport. It never showed up, and there was a lot of speculation. Were, was this you know, a pilot taking, uh, taking uh, uh, fans up the trail, or were they delivering supplies, or were they just out on you know, kind of a, an afternoon flight? But uh, they were not uh, seen back at the airport at the at the uh, appropriate time, and they put out a huge search effort, and nothing was ever found until later this week, and they found that plane uh, right near uh, Finger Lake, and unfortunately they had wrecked, and uh, the the person inside, his name was was uh, uh, his name has not been released at least at, at turn at the turn of this. Uh, release on the podcast, but uh, his body was found in there, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, his family was notified and all of that, and, and unfortunately, he did not make it back to where he was supposed to go. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very sad story, and, um, and you know, one, one problem with uh, a state like Alaska is because there are so many, um, so many small planes and so, and uh, travel around Alaska. Uh, when you, when you get outside of, you know, the, the larger communities is mostly in these kind of small planes. And uh, you know, it would be, it would be great if there were never any accidents and there were never any crashes, but I, I think given how much plane travel there is that, you know, there always are a couple and it's, and it's, and it's very sad when there are fatalities. Right. Uh, One last piece of news, and this is again, weather related. And since we are in the the dog days of summer and and the heat is, is is definitely a factor for mushing and sled dogs. You saw a post uh, earlier this week from Facebook about, uh, one of the Iditarod mushers that's working up on the glaciers with his dogs, and he has to bring those dogs down early because uh, just the heat of summer and uh, you know all of the all of the sunshine and all, all of that is causing uh, a little bit of havoc up there on a season that typically lasts at least through August, uh, the beginning of September. What can you share about that? Yeah, so there are there are a couple of large glaciers in Alaska where there are um, uh, sled dog tours and tour companies, and um, uh, many of the many of the larger kennels will will either send all of their dogs or most of their dogs up there, and then there are also some smaller kennels that uh, will send some dogs up there, and it's a it's a good way for for dogs at smaller kennels who, um, uh, you know, probably don't have as much uh, trail time during the winter to get a little bit of extra trail time. They are up there with, with dogs from much more competitive teams. And as, as you know, if you're, if you're trying to get better in any sport, the best way to do that is to, to play with and play against people who are better than you. Um, and that that goes for sled dogs as well. If you want a sled dog to to start doing a lot better, put him or her in with some sled dogs who are more competitive and more experienced. And uh, most of the time, that dog will rise to the occasion. Um, so because of because of these issues that you've mentioned, the the heat, um, uh, they had to pretty much close up the. Um, the sled dog rides very, very early in, in July, as opposed to most years, September and some years, even October, they, they've still been doing that. Um, you know, I, I, we're, we're used to, people are used to seeing, uh, you know, the before and after pictures or pictures from 25 years ago versus pictures of now that show how uh, a lot of glaciers are retreating and receding um, and just aren't nearly as big as they were in the past. But in addition to that, 
uh, people who who have never really been on a glacier, it's hard to imagine what what is really going on in a glacier. And it's very much it, it's not a static um, it's not a static thing. It's very much made up of lots of little pieces of ice and snow that are pretty much constantly moving. And I, I've read things by people who have who've worked in these sled dog camps and have, you know, stayed on the glacier. And they talk about how you can, you can sit in your tent at night and you can just hear the glacier moving underneath you. Um, so in, in part because of that, and in part because of the unseasonably warm temperatures that we've had in Alaska uh, this summer, it, the decision was made that it would be better to, um, to bring the dogs off and not, uh, not extend the season there, but I have, I have never heard of the dogs being brought down from the glacier in July before. It seems very, very early to me. It does seem early, and we alluded to the things that are, are going to be cause of concern for mushing in the future, and this hits on two of those uh, real quickly before we go. It hits on number one, uh, climate change and how, how the weather is changing, the way uh, mushing teams operate, and number two, in regard to economy. Uh, when a musher only uh, works half of the year, and if his if his in, employment is his dogs up on the glacier, and that's where he's earning his income for the year. If that season is in effect almost cut cut in half or cut short by at least a month or two, that really hits close to the pocketbook. And uh, unfortunately, uh, something like this, where they have to leave this early, is a huge cause of concern in, in regard to in. Two of those, two of those pieces that I think are, are going to be uh, big players in the future of mushing. Alex, we're almost out of time. Anything you want to mention in closing? Uh, you know, I just wanted to thank all of our listeners. We we um, don't say it often enough. I know we say it occasionally, but we both Robert and I really just appreciate you guys so much. And as as always, if you have comments or suggestions or uh, potential show topics or things that you are a little bit confused about. Um, we would love to hear from you. And a lot of these things that people suggest end up being uh, topics that we cover in future shows. Couldn't have said it better myself. Alex, thank you very much for joining us today. And again, I apologize to our listeners that are hearing dogs barking in the background. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast. On behalf of my co-host today, Alex Stein, this is Robert Forto for Mushing Radio. We'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. All right, Alex, thanks a lot. See you soon. From Dog Works Radio, this is Mushing Radio. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we invite you to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link on the episode notes. You can tap or swipe on the episode cover art, and you'll see some offers from our sponsors. You can support our show by supporting them. If you like what you have heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe, too. Your hosts are Alex Stein and Robert Forto. Our producer is Robert Forto, created for Dog Works Radio. Did you know that Alaska Dog Works trains service dogs for those in need throughout North America? Each and every service dog that is trained through the Lead Dog Service Dog Program and Michelle Forto and her team has an individual training plan. We train for autistic, mobility, psychiatric, and PTSD for our soldiers for service work. If you know of someone that may need a service dog, please take a moment and check out Alaska Dog Works on social media and at alaskadogworks.com.